So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to have you here in this mid-December day. Um, I'm Richard Grusin. I'm the, uh, am I like muted? No, I'm not, thank you. I'm Richard Grusin. I'm director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. And I'm really delighted to have with us uh, about half of our contributors uh, to our forthcoming volume, The Ends of Cinema or ends of cinema know the. Um, and so, and I'm really glad that all of you are here as well. We will begin just to give you a heads up on format. This is our last uh, event of the fall season, uh, our fall Fridays at C21. And uh, we've got events planned for the spring, but not yet announced, so stay posted. Uh, we'll be going in alphabetical order with our five panelists, beginning with Caitlin Benson Allen. Uh, I don't think, I don't plan on introducing people. I think everybody knows who they are, but if individuals want to identify themselves and say something about who they are, feel free. Um, and then uh, everybody will speak for about five minutes. We've asked people to address the sort of the problematic or thematic of the conference that the that uh, Ends of Cinema is based upon, conference of the same name, which was that cinema has been for uh, almost since its inception, maybe even before its inception, cinema has been ending. And there have been calls for uh, a variety of reasons for why cinema had, had reached its end. When I thought about doing this conference and contacted Jocelyn, my approach to this was, um, to think about digital cinema and post cinema and uh, imagined a conference that would look like that. And then Jocelyn, who knows much more about uh, cinema history than I do, was like, wait a minute, you know, there's no ends of cinema. There's nothing particularly special and new about digital cinema. Cinema has been ending forever. And um, so I stood corrected. And I think our conference in our book reflects that. Uh, the pandemic is raised for us, I think, the question once more, because um, because of social distancing and all the quarantine that's been happening, theaters have been virtually closed uh, during the pandemic. There have been some theaters that did open for a while uh, in a very scattered, that is to say, well, scattered in many ways, uh, scattered across cities and a scattered audience, but now everything is shut back down. The Ends of Cinema did provide some new forms of exhibition or let's say renewed old forms, drive-in film movies became popular again, which was kind of cool. Uh, and I think out, some outdoor screenings and, and things like that. But it seemed as if yet the pandemic yet once more has uh, proposed another end of cinema, but like any good zombie cinema refuses to die. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over uh, to Jocelyn, my co-editor, co-host, friend, and colleague. And we'll ask her to say a couple words and then hand the mic off. So if you have questions, sorry, last piece of um, information. I guess the chat is not disabled. It looked like it was, but there's a and a um, tab you should have. So the idea would be probably to put your questions there. But if you want to put them in the chat, that will work too. We're pretty uh, flexible around here. Okay, Jocelyn, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Jocelyn sepaniak -Elise. I am an associate professor of English and film studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, that this book is like my absolute dream. I can't think of a better slate of contributors of people that I respect more, that I'm so happy to know, um, and of people that are genuinely committed to intellectual community and to learning and talking together. It, it really is a dream book for me. Um, so I hope that it's a dream book too for uh, others that get to read it as well. Um, as Richard mentioned, of course, we've seen uh, this impact of the pandemic on um, cinema as one of its ends in that um, theaters are closing across the country. Um, that's, of course, been a really difficult situation for the industry. Movie sets have been shut down as well. Um, but another end I think we can think about is that of sociality. Um, 
And maybe when we look at that in this era, that gives us another idea about some of the ends of cinema, which is how much we fall back on the assumption that cinema can enclose itself into like this special little island that doesn't let in discourses of public health or governance or um, social justice issues, right? That, that all of these things can be um, can be kind of shuttered off into a different area that exists somehow outside the bonds of cinema. Well, I think we're seeing that that's absolutely not true. And we should have known this, right? We should have known this based on uh, the 1918 uh, pandemic, based on the flu and the impact on Hollywood and the theater industry at that moment in time too, um, as just one of the many uh, examples that we've heard over the past year. Um, but we still fall back on old habits, right? And these old habits include the notion that there are these defined borders around things, especially around around cinema. And maybe in light of this year, especially, maybe that's because we just want to believe in the escape it provides. Um, it's been really funny as I've been reading these uh, kind of year end best of lists uh, this year. What I keep seeing over and over and over again is the notion of escape. Right, the notion of um, getting somewhere else, uh, being somewhere else besides in your house when you're watching films. And in a weird way, it seems like immersion is making this kind of unexpected comeback but in our homes this time. But yet the elision that I've actually missed the most this year um, is that of the contingency and frustrations and surprises that come about when we watch things with other people. So this year, what I'm really hoping is that we see another end to cinema and that's an end to thinking of it and as and, and thinking of us as being sealed and hermetically little sealed little bubbles, right? None of us are. Um, that's what I value in cinema and that's what I value in intellectual community. So I hope we get to have some semblance of that this afternoon as we all talk together. Um, I'm so delighted to have Caitlin, James, Francesco, Michael, and Jennifer with us today. They are brilliant scholars and wonderful people. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Caitlin benson Allen. <laughs> thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you, Richard, um, for organizing this and bringing us all back together again. Um, so I'm Caitlin benson Allett. I teach Film and Media Studies at Georgetown University, and I'm also the editor of JCMS, uh, the journal formerly known as Cinema Journal. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on my paper and where I, I thought it fit in our original conference and then try to talk um, quite briefly um, about the current alleged end of cinema and um, why I think we might be um, approaching it from the wrong angle. Um, so when I got uh, Richard and Jocelyn's wonderful invitation um, to think about the ends of cinema, I was in the middle of a book that'll be coming out this spring called The Stuff of Spectatorship, Material Cultures of Film and Television. So I was um, in this moment thinking not about the death of cinema, but deaths at the cinema, uh, cinema violence, attacks, um, gun, gun, gunfire, or um, stabbings, or um, other forms of physical violence and loss of life in movie theaters, uh, which have been around for as long as movie theaters have been around. Um, and this, this was one chapter in a larger project um, that thinks about how the objects that we surround ourselves with and that we consume while consuming film and television are as constitutive of the meanings of film and television as their contents it themselves. Um, so as we think about the ongoing crisis uh, of theatrical exhibition, I'll put crisis in um, scare quotes there. Um, I wanna always be thinking of it, I'm always drawn to thinking of it uh, in materialist terms. Um, so when I think about allegations of crisis in the 20th century and responses to them in the exhibition industry, I start by thinking about um, digital projection and um, the, what, what was that? The third, fourth rise of uh, 3D projection um, that really peaked around 2009. Um, and the, remember we all had the little black glasses that were trying to kind of look like wayfarers this time, like it was all going to be risky business at the theater again. And um, wearing those little glasses, bringing digital projectors into the theater served um, to forestall one end of cinema, right? Because while it turned out within five or six years that 
3D projection was a fad yet again. The introduction of digital projection was in fact a great boon to the bottom line, more of distributors than exhibitors, but exhibitors to, to a certain extent. Yet really what has saved the cinema business, what it has allowed that zombie to carry on in the 21st century has been, as it has been since the Great Depression in a sense, concessions and specifically adult concessions. So as we all might remember, um, exhibitors make up to 85% of their revenues from the concession stand, from the soda, the popcorn, and increasingly from alcohol sales. Uh, alcohol sales have been part of theatrical exhibition since before the Nickelodeon era, right? Since um, <coughs> Roxy opened the uh, family theater um, in his father-in-law's saloon or the room in the back of his father-in-law's saloon uh, in the first years of the 20th century. But increasingly in the 21st century, mainstream exhibitors, by which I mean first run exhibitors, have been turning to alcohol to supplement the concession stands because it turns out that alcohol sales and concessions are incremental, meaning that when you buy a glass of wine or a beer at the movie theater, it tends not to detract from the amount of money you are spending on concessions already, right? You still get the popcorn, you still get the candy, and then the theater owners are also getting the markup on that beer or wine. The reintroduction post prohibition of alcohols to um, hard top first run theater, well, to hard top theaters began in 1975 and um, to first run hard top theaters in 1989. But you may have noticed the trend really taking off around 2008 when AMC was the first of the big three exhibitor chains in the United States to start a dine in theater right, a movie theater where um, you are encouraged to have dinner and a movie at the same time. They have since then learned, AMC and uh, their competitors, that, well, you know, making um, tacos and uh, veggie burgers is all well and good, but as is the case in so many restaurants, the real profits are in the alcohol. And this is very important for us to understand when we think about how exhibitors are going to survive the present crisis, right? How they are going to bounce back from um, the current material threat because a virus is after all a material threat to in this case, human, um, human health and human safety. We need to understand that these exhibitors are not um, primarily in the business business of showing films. These are fundamentally now in terms of their business plans, bars and restaurants that happen to have a movie playing in the background. That is their business model. And that is why the cinema safe procedures as we're seeing them being proposed by NATO aren't making us feel it any better and aren't really going to solve the problem, right? There's a material conflict between the mask you should be wearing and the beer you want to be drinking when going back to the theater to see, I don't know, um, <laughs> Top Gun 2 or whatever it is that floats your boat. So when I'm thinking about the ends of cinema in the days to come, I think we need to understand those ends in terms of the food service business. We need to look at this from the point of view of the, of the exhibitors as business people. If we want to understand how cinema makes ends meet in the 21st century. And I'll leave that there. Thanks, everyone. Well, so shall I just jump in now? Uh, we're going in alphabetical order. That was really beautiful. And thanks to Jocelyn and Richard. And Jocelyn, I really just wish I could um, have put quotation marks around your opening remarks because they're going to reverberate with mine, but in a way that was so much more beautifully stated. Um, you know, writing obituaries of the cinema has been the most consistent and stable thing about the medium or more accurately, the media industries and experiences that for convenience and out of laziness, we condense into that word cinema. 
Now, my contribution to the book uh, is titled What Returns, What Remains, Garbage, Ghosts, and Two Ends of Cinema. And it posits the necessity for thinking with the material remnants and immaterial remnants of cinema, two of its most insistent ends for any history or theory of the medium broadly conceived and worthy of that name. Cinema, as I understand it, is a phantom techné. It's an experience of haunting generated by a variegated industry, uh, as Alison uh, uh, just uh, Caitlin just beautifully um, uh, described for us, um, that um, that produces lots of products and byproducts, uh, many of which we could classify as garbage, which of course is no innocent term. Garbage and ghosts are two ends of cinema, but also two emblems of our time the concrete and ephemeral figures we in the humanities have a responsibility to understand, to address and to work with. So how has the pandemic changed what I've been thinking about or offered an opportunity to extend it? Well, everything I wrote for my contribution is precise, correct and will endure as a monument to eternal thought. Uh, even as what I wrote uh, emphasizes that the only ontology worth a damn is a hauntology, which is to say that I would insist that what remains and what returns in cinema has to be characterized and understood by a non self identical nature, at least in part. The phrase that's been reverberating me um, for the past with me for the past week as I thought about this great event um, was, uh, in fact, Gilles Deleuze's refrain, the people are missing. Um, this is the absence that is haunting me right now. The people are missing. And really, I'm missing the people. The pandemic has shuttered most of the public aspects of cinema, the spaces with big screens um, where we take in images and sounds and eat stuff, as well as the social aspects of cinema as a mode of production, which is to say the forms of proximate collective labor it often requires to be made. Um, I'm really worried for my neighborhood cinemas, the Royal, the Paradise, the Review, the Lightbox, and all the people who work in them and gather in them. The last time I saw a movie, it's also the last time I saw Francesco, uh, was at a program of films of Jean Panlevé that I introduced in New Haven, uh, where a local cop, uh, couple walked in and chatted the entire time uh, until a concerned graduate student shushed them. I miss those people. Uh, at a screening of Cats, which was the second to last movie I saw in the theater. Two teenagers snuck in bottles of malt liquor, hid in the back row, only to accidentally knock one of those bottles onto its side and have it roll down the entire graded floor, slowly getting louder and more embarrassing for these people and more thrilling for me. I miss those people. And the students who fall asleep and dream during classes and screenings at colleges and universities the globe over, I miss them too. I miss them most of all. So much of cinema is a set of encounters with the unexpected and the unknown that have, for the moment, in many ways, been foreclosed. Uh, and we could recall here what Gilbert Cohen Seyat said when he defined cinema in the, the 50s, he said cinema is everything that is outside of the film. Um, so I'll just conclude by saying the other thing I've been thinking about besides being totally excited by the new forms of cinema of temporal expansion and temporal condensation, TikTok and other things that have emerged, these new genres of the pandemic, is I've been thinking about the ends of cinema studies. I'm an administrator, I'm the director of the Cinema Studies Institute, and most of my time for the past nine months has been spent thinking about how we continue to teach this medium in absence of everything that Jocelyn mentioned to us. Those encounters, those forms of sociality, those unexpected social forces that shape our reception, as well as the production and thinking through these things. And I'm deeply concerned, and this is the one thing I didn't talk about in my essay, about the new forms of vampirism and pandemic austerity that are emerging, and that I think the new ends of cinema and cinema studies have to be ready to face when we have the luxury and opportunity to repopulate those haunted and haunting spaces from which the people are missing. So I'll end there. I think it's me now. I'm, my name is Francesco Casetti and I teach at Yale. 
after many years I taught in Italy. That's, that's quite apparent that I'm Italian, also because I speak this way. Uh, I followed James and that, that I, I completely uh, loved uh, his piece. Yes, uh, uh, um, Jocelyn, is a dream book. It's, it's a wonderful book. I got the proof and uh, for a mistake, I guess, I got the entire book for the proof. So I corrected my piece, but I read the entire book. I correct my piece that I found a little, very, not bad, but boring. But on the contrary, I found wonderful. The piece of the people here, they are absolutely great. Caitlin, thank you for reminding that death at cinema is important. Jennifer, you provide the most spectacular uh, uh, example of uh, what uh, 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 a bar called an ant uh, anterior future. It was there, but it's going to die. That's great, very powerful. James, your formula, uh, uh, it's uh, cinema is what remains and what returns. It's fantastic. It applies to my last book, uh, but it's entirely yours. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry because otherwise I, I, I should have uh, uh, stolen from you. And, uh, and Jocelyn, you provided, and Michael, this, this idea of connecting blackness, death, uh, and the wonderful analysis uh, of, uh, of reading. So I enjoyed a lot. And Jocelyn provided at the very beginning a true map for reading the entire book. And the book is, is about entanglement, how cinema is entangled with something else. And that is uh, what I really loved. Uh, uh, Caitlin, film guns and tacos. And uh, James, film ghost waste. Michael, film blackness death. And Jennifer, film nature extinction. That's, uh, that's a very provoking book. So going what I, 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 I miss during the pandemic and what I didn't miss. I didn't miss images. I had a bunch of images. I'm binge watching, binge watching a lot of series, included the Downtown Abbey that I've never seen and I should never have seen, but during the pandemic you do unexpected choices. And I'm watching this film, that this series that I detest. It's so horrible, it's deeply horrible so popular and so horrible. And on the opposite, I love, and I do not know how is the ending. So I'm in the third season over uh, in, in, in six, uh, the, uh, the French Village, which is a powerful European uh, uh, series. And uh, that's, that's uh, it could maybe an opportunity to analyze how the American narrative are so, uh, effective and and not nuanced, and how the European uh, narrative are not maybe not effective, but so wonderful, disturbed, so wonderful going one side on the other, etc. What I missed, of course, I missed uh, people like James did, but I also miss places. And to me, it's extremely important. It's not only that I miss the film theater, but I miss also my <clears throat> living room in which the big, big screen was put in a way that and the couch and you dim the lights and you transform magically one set of, of, of uh, uh, the house. Now I cannot do that because in that, uh, uh, in, in that room now I have my position, I my, my post for teaching, for chatting, and, and all the attention goes to my computer, no longer to the big, big uh, screen. And it's more difficult to dim lights and to recreate this magic atmosphere. So I missed places. 
and uh, just for uh, the people who dare uh, to read uh, boring pieces, uh, in my own pieces, uh, what I did was, uh, was I like to do, is to read extensively all the mostly Western uh, film theories, uh, especially early film theories. Con I mean, reconstructing the way in which, in which theorists were speaking about screen. And why sur surprise? It, it was a surprise. They do not speak so much about screen and images. It's not the entanglement that works. They spoke of screen, images, and places. They were obsessed by the idea of where, not only what on the screen, where the screen, and how the screen changes the places. And this is something that is touching to me, is provoking to me, and uh, is moving forward the idea that uh, what we deal mostly are not uh, <coughs> optical media, but optical and environmental media. And I think that uh, that is true for film, is true also for two other media that I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm studying, Phantasmagoria and Panorama, and it's true also for new media, GPS, uh, your computer, etc., where, where the where the image appear and how to appear in some place is such important. So uh, environmental optical media, I think uh, we are discovering that uh, and uh, in the pandemic, and we are discovering in the pandemic uh, that our place, our environment is the little cell in which each of us are. And I like the idea of cell because cell, at least in American, it doesn't work in Italian and little bit, a little worse also <clears throat> in French and in German, cell means uh, the the question of I mean uh, the 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 question of a prison the, the cell is a prison we are framed in the cell but cell is also a biological element is the element and all together these people I'm saying in in on my computer we are framed in our cells but all together we can create a good organism. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Jocelyn and Richard, for not only this collection, but also the event itself. It's, uh, I had a really amazing time just kind of being embedded in the range of work that was being made available. Um, and uh, Milwaukee, it's a great town. I, I really appreciated having, <laughs> I finally got to Milwaukee. Um, so uh, by way of, you know, in terms of what I was thinking, in terms of talking about briefly, uh, I couldn't help but reflect back to my second semester in graduate school at NYU, which began with a lot of uh, conversation about Susan Sontag's piece, The Decay of Cinema. Uh, where she insisted that uh, perhaps perhaps cinema is not dead, it's that cinephilia is dead. Um, to which um, I thought, um, well, this is hysterical, if not delusional, but also a marking of a particular passage around the idea of cinema. Um, and, and it seems to me that the more that these kind of proclamations from the Mount about the death of cinema, also the mark a passage of a, a, a dominant mode of thinking about cinema more broadly. Um, I have, in, in terms of thinking of this particular moment of 2020, probably the worst 12 act play ever. Um, uh, I have more access to films than I've ever had before uh, in terms of the ways in which uh, the various special events that have been put on with filmmakers and film festivals. Uh, and honestly, I think I have more motivation than I've ever had before to try and gorge myself on as much cinema as I can. Um, but I do miss the debriefings 
Um, uh, I, I miss the shitty projectionists and I do miss the masterful ones too. Um, I miss the inappropriate laughter uh, or, or more really maybe it's more of a desperate attempt to laugh something away. Uh, I, 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 um, I miss uh, and I miss, uh, you know, being in New York. I, I, I love this town, but I have to say the world's shittiest Q&A sessions ever. Yes, New York City. Um, I miss that thrill of once the credits are done that I have to desperately get the hell out of here before someone says something uh, that's going to piss me off. Um, but more and more, um, you know, you know, in terms of transitioning and thinking about my piece, a lot, you know, I was particularly thinking about, you know, my own investment and my own measure of cinephilia around the, the prompt of the ends of cinema. And I had begun to do some work, uh, a kind of work that, that I felt compelled to do, that I was triggered by Christina, Sharp, uh, Christina Sharp's work in the wake. And I began to kind of think about, is it possible to conceive of a cinema in the wake? I wasn't necessarily drawn to work that was strictly about a portrayal of Black death. I was, I was very much thinking about the kind of critical consequence around the rendering of Black Death, right? So um, again, you know, one of the one of the, the 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 generative kind of triggering moments that I had going to Milwaukee again, thinking back to graduate school, um, seemingly embedded in an ongoing conversation between formalists and cultural studies people. Um, and I think over the course of my of my graduate education, feeling uh, growing more and more ambivalent with either position, and and trying to find a way of of writing where I wanted to be, which was to be equally inspired by these two poles. So my piece is called "Pieces of a Dream: Film Blackness and Black Death." Um, it's it's kind of building, as I said on work that I began right after my book, Film Blackness, American Cinema, and the idea of black film came out. Um, I focus on four films. Um, I revisit some of these. I've, I've, I've written about these films previously, but I, I really appreciated the opportunity to kind of rethink the work and expand upon it. And those pieces were Lila Weaver's Dead Nigger Boulevard, uh, New Atama, Francis Badomo's Everybody Dies, Jatavia Gary's An Ecstatic Experience, and A. Saida Clark's White. Um, so for me, I would try to think uh, about what ends of cinema might mean in terms of thinking of the always already radicality of blackness and film form. And uh, again, I'm just really appreciative for that I, that I was invited and that this collection is coming out. So thank you. Yeah, this is so fabulous. I want to thank Jocelyn, Richard, all the other panelists here, also the audience and future readers of this book. And I want to echo what everyone has said so far. The book is really exciting. And I love this idea that it is about cinema as an entanglement, right? I think that's exactly right. Um, so I'm very pleased to be a part of this book and happy to be a part of this event. I'll just say a few kind of offhand remarks about my piece, which is about cinema and the environment, about film history and the environment. Um, so the title of my piece is Cinema, Nature and Endangerment. And in the piece, I talk about three archival films from the 1920s. These are unknown films. They're housed in an archival collection at the University of Southern California. Um, there are short films about nature in the 1920s. One of them is called Nature's Handiwork, and it shows insects, many of which are now endangered, such as the tortoiseshell butterfly. Um, it, there's another one called, um, called The Four Seasons by Raymond Dittmars, who was actually a zoologist and a herpetologist at the Bronx Zoo. Um, this is a film that shows eternal seasons remaining always the same in the 1920s. And of course, this is no longer the case in the face of global warming. Nature is no longer eternal. 
Um, and then the third film I wrote about is a glacier film. It's about melting glaciers and it's by um, filmmakers who are not very well known. So I I'm trying in this piece to kind of um, reactivate unknown archival films in, in our space today and think about how not only we can kind of access these films, which are all available online, thanks to the um, wonderful archive at USC who has a, um, a great archivist, you know, Everett and a really nice um, series of videos you can access online, but also how filmmakers today might reuse and remediate these films if they choose to make found films using these old archival uh, pieces of footage. And I think in the digital space, there is a real paradise of possibility for reusing old images of nature. So this is what I was trying to think about in my piece. Now, what's changed since 2018, since our conference is of course the uh, precipitous decline in biodiversity continues. And there was actually just yesterday, a new report released by the IUCN Red List of Endangered Species, which is the kind of international body that catalogs um, endangered species. And uh, in this new report, which got a fair bit of press as these reports always do, uh, they announced that 31 animal and plant species are newly declared extinct and um, all freshwater dolphins are severely endangered and, and on and on. Um, but of course, not all species in the world have been identified. So the act of chronicling endangerment and extinction is itself a kind of act of incompleteness which is paralleled, I think, by the seemingly infinite world of media that we're currently living in. We can never grasp all of it. It's just entirely out of our hands. Um, and yet we want to, we try, we want to try to catalog it through genres, through places and, and so on and so forth. So that's one thing that hasn't so much changed, but continued. Um, and then another thing I think that has changed since 2018 or continued is a little more positive. I think we have a growing and increased sense of public ecological awareness, right? And this is largely happening through media. Um, it's really interesting to me to see how streaming, mainstream streaming platforms like Netflix are really foregrounding environmental documentaries now. I am a fan of the David Attenborough documentary, A Life in Film, I think it's called. Um, which is about extinction. And also films like My Octopus Teacher, you know, these are really kind of cool and they're reaching a mainstream audience. And I think this is actually showing how media can do good work to help increase environmental awareness. The films that I tend to write about are often not very well known, either deliberately unknown archival films or else experimental films, right? And this is kind of the world a lot of us inhabit, but it's, it's a kind of smaller audience. But I do think in those worlds too, images of nature really have a lot of power to help us think about the future, which we urgently have to think about now. So I guess in conclusion, I would say, what I've been thinking about now is thinking through the concept of endangerment more thoroughly in terms of extinction studies, which is a kind of growing body of um, research and scholarship in the environmental humanities, and thinking about media as media's power to form collectivities, right? Because the only solutions we're going to find now are political and collective. So I'm inspired by the activism of this past summer with Black Lives Matter. I'm also inspired by the activism, activism of Extinction Rebellion. These are formations that I think can coalesce around media. Um, but also I'm really interested in seeing where popular environmental awareness might grow through um, popular media as well, even in something you know as broad and banal as Netflix. I do think there, there's, uh, potentiality there. Um, although, you know, I remain super cynical <laughs> about our ability to um, rein in global warming and uh, habitat loss in time to really save enough, but we have to do what we can. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. There it is. Okay, I'll take uh, 
chair's advantage to say something first. And uh, those of you, if you have comments or questions in the audience, uh, feel free to enter them either in the chat or in that uh, Q&A. But what I was thinking, I mean, so I miss all of you and I miss actually thinking with people. Um, and I have a lot, something maybe more intelligent to say now than I did before when I was just thinking by myself. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about this conversation and in a way how we framed the event was um, a kind of general sense that the pandemic created some kind of, was some kind of a rupture and some kind of a break and that things really, something changed at least temporarily perhaps during the pandemic. And so we talked about that, we lost things and so forth. But to go back to sort of my initial sense that it would be interesting to think about how digital cinema provided an end of cinema initially, one of the things that I think is so interesting about how social arrangements have changed in the pandemic is how we were prepared technically through our multiple forms of distributed mediation for the pandemic. Um, we were things like uh, distance learning, which has been, you know, going on for a long time. There's been a, a push for distance learning. There's been a push back against distance learning by many of us because we were afraid of what that might do to the job of, of teaching, the job of being a professor, to student life and so forth. Many of us were, you know, clamoring for distance. You know, we can't be on campus in the fall. You know, we have to learn at a distance. So that was kind of interesting, but this technology already was there. Similarly, technologies for DoorDash, Grubhub, ordering delivery online, telecommuting generally, all of these kinds of digital technologies already existed. And so there's a way in which we could think about the pandemic, not necessarily, or perhaps not only as generating changes, but actually as having been generated by the changes that we'd seen through our media formations over the past decades. And that, and even if you start to think about how pandemics uh, circulate through global media networks, media of transportation, especially, but communication networks as well, you can see that in a way, the pandemic didn't necessarily create these new forms of sociality, but in a way were produced by them. And one of the ways I, reasons I'm thinking about that is I taught, a, I was teaching intro to English studies this semester and I decided to make the course about the representation of plagues and pandemics in literature and film. And it was mostly literature, but we ended up uh, teaching, I ended up teaching uh, the film Contagion from uh, 2010, I believe it is, and 10 or 11. And, um, Contagion is a really kind of interesting film in light of the present moment. It's on the one hand, remarkably prescient about what happened and what we've seen in the pandemic, but there's also things that are really missing from it because Contagion didn't imagine the kind of distributed telework, the distributed education that we've all been living through now. That was just not part of that film at all. Not that it didn't exist 10 years ago, but it didn't exist as extensively as it does now. Um, and the other part of, the other thing that I thought was so interesting about Contagion, which is a scary film to watch uh, at this moment in time. And it's really scary at the beginning when you see how the, when, uh, Soderbergh very carefully shows you without comment, right, the way in which it's being uh, communicated from Hong Kong and then across the globe, um, just, you know, visually and without telling us anything, he just really shows it to us. But what's interesting about that, and the other thing that I thought was anticipated there, is another part of our moment, which also preceded the pandemic, and that is the kind of viral pandemic of false news that we've seen and fake media, you know, the whole Trump scenario, the whole lack of truth and the contagiousness of that. And one of the things that I was struck by in Contagion was how for that film, Soderbergh was both concerned about the pandemic of 
the virus, but was also concerned about the pandemic of social media. So there are a number of moments in the film that are about the competition between old and new media, and in this case, film as an older medium. Um, Alan Crumway, the Jude, Law, Jude Law's character, um, you know, he says print is dead. And then another character says blogging isn't really writing. Blogging is just, you know, graffiti with punctuation. And so there's this whole kind of tension there between these new distributed technologies and cinema. And I think Soderbergh, you can see him playing or his characters at least playing them out. And then the last thing I'll say about that and just, you know, turn this over. I don't know if Jocelyn has something to say as well, or if there are questions, but there's also this one really interesting exchange um, between the head of the CDC who's being interviewed on Sanjay Goop, by Sanjay Gupta on CNN and um, Alan Crumway, the this blogger, uh, Jude Law's blogger who comes on and starts accusing uh, CDC of hiding effective um, cures. He says there are cures, but the pharmaceutical company and CDC are in cahoots and they won't let people know about it. It's pure Trump. There's something called forsythia that he's uh, selling as a sort of he has investing in basically, um, that's this fake cure. But this exchange is um, head of the CDC says to get infected by the disease, you need to come in contact with someone who's sick. To get scared, all you have to come in contact with is a rumor on the television or the internet. The fear is far more dangerous than the disease. And for him then the message paranoia is a virus as well as the virus itself. And I just then want to just, you know, tie that up and end by suggesting that while the pandemic has COVID has produced all of these horrible changes um, and all of these losses that we've uh, all been dealing with. And I mean, really horrible losses, not just of sociality, but of people we love and so forth. Uh, it's also the case that these pandemics today are part of or have been produced by the very media and technologies that they have also been in the process of changing. That is, they were already, the ground was already there for us to live this way. So it's both a rupture in a sense, and I think a kind of fulfillment or culmination of changes that have been happening uh, for quite some time now. So that's my little stick. Jocelyn, do you want to comment or does anybody else of any of the panelists want to get in before we turn to questions? I'll just say just a quick thing, uh, just a very quick response to everybody's uh, points and to Richard, which is that uh, just this afternoon, I watched the new Peter Strickland short, Cold Meridian, uh, which is really, uh, it's really striking. It's all, it's kind of engaging in his ASMR obsession. Um, so, it's, uh, you know, he's had the sound design kind of thing going on. Um, and it's showing on movie and the movie uh, description said, put your headphones on. And I was like, fuck you movie. I don't want to put my headphones on. I want to watch things with like the sound all around me. I want to experience things um, crashing at my ears. And I want to experience, you know, my cats walking around um, as I'm paying attention to this at the same time. I don't want that sealed off, you know, modernist kind of experience. Um, that I feel like I've been living in, in this metal cube for like the past, you know, nine months. Um, and what Caitlin said to start off was that there's this point of material conflict between the mask and the beer, right? It's like these two things are impossible to like exist together. Um, and I think all of us are pointing to this notion of that impossibility when things come crashing together, when things try to be entangled with one another um, and they can't, they can't ever um, be brought together in any way that's an actual synthesis, you know? Um, but it's that kind of moment of conflict and juxtaposition um, and engagement where, you know, where um, film studies and cultural studies can never quite come together exactly, right? Or excuse me, the formalists and the cultural studies folks can't quite come together. But we're gonna try to make them speak to each other anyway, right? We can never um, preserve, we can never turn what has been um, 
made into an icon of waste into something that is treasure, but we're going to sift through all of it again and try to figure out what are these things that are haunting us. And we'll never be able to catalog the entire world and save um, these, ob these, uh, these, uh, these creatures and insects that are disappearing, but we're still going to bring them into a kind of uh, material uh, relationship with each other by, um, by, by preserving them in film in some way. So I think this notion of the material conflict um, is what we can also add to the idea of entanglement because it's that kind of um, bringing things together, that kind of cacophony um, where I tear off my headphones and I want to hear everything else around me that I think everybody's also kind of talking about today. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, I, I just rewatched The Last Waltz and that one begins with this movie should be played loud. So a much better than put on your headphones. Uh, any of the panelists want to Chime in or should we've got a couple of questions we can go there. Michael? Yeah, um, I, I, I just want to say, you know, um, much respect for the contagion, but um, don't leave Andromeda strain out in the cold. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that 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 film needs some 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 more love. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Great. Next time I teach this, I'll make sure I do. Um, OK, we have. Um, one question from YouTube and one question in the Q&A. Uh, the YouTube one's shorter. I'll read that one first. Um, this is uh, from Kevin Shab Shabbat uh, or Shabo. Thank you for these talks. What does the panel think about the current strategies to facilitate communal viewing while apart? Watch parties, Twitch live streams, pressing play at the same time, et cetera. Can, can I start to answer? Uh, this kind of practice uh, uh, started uh, more than 10 years ago. And now I, they have, uh, I mean, a revival and, and they flourish. And this is, uh, <clears throat> um, this is, they are different uh, ways of, of, of doing this practice. Uh, basically, the real point is that you blog during during the watching of a film, so you make comments, and in this sense, uh, you do a very contradictory element. You regain the sociality, the sociality of, of the film theater, but also you do something that in the film theater is forbidden: you chat. And these two elements uh, together, they are quite uh, very interesting. You feel the idea of watching a movie with other, and in, moreover, you can speak with the other, which is something that you cannot do in, in, in a real film theater. I, I like it. I, I was part of them uh, sometimes, and uh, there are people that have a, a real competence in social networking and they are fantastic. They are super, super good. So the competence can, doesn't come from film, comes from, from, from uh, social networking. Richard, you're muted. James, you want to go? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, and uh, hello, Kevin, brilliant scholar of spectral media, Kevin Chabot. Um, I just wanted to mention that I think this, like, the, the desire of getting back in sync uh, at this moment of profound kind of asynchronous learning and the kind of profound dislocations and, and forms of jet lag of our moment is a, a kind of beautiful um, uh, impulse I've, I've, I'm reminded of doing this with friends with cassette tapes when like, you know, that you would all try to press play at the same time with that. So it's also a media practice that has a, a longer history to, to look into. And, you know, the way in which we can build communal time, I think is super important, but that's kind of a banal response <laughs> after Francesco's. 
Yeah, I just have a quick answer to that because Shira, I don't know if everyone can see that, just said, um, she pointed out that I've done live tweeting exercises in my classes before, and I feel like this um, live, you know, watching on Twitch or Netflix party is kind of similar, but it's really an exercise in, in divided attention, right? And as Francesco just said, it's kind of about people who are good at it are kind of about good at something else. They're good at the live tweeting rather than about the film knowledge per se. And I think it's interesting, James, that you just went back to a, an old example of doing this with cassette tapes. I'm gonna go back to an old example of going to drive-in theaters with comedians. I have a friend who used to, who knows a bunch of comedians who took me to a couple of these events in the early aughts. And it was so great to sit back and listen to these comedians talk to the drive-in. But like, these are the things that we don't have now, right? So for me, what's missing in, is not only the public space of the theater, it's not only my students and my friends, it's just the public, right? The random people is what I really miss. There's so many great memories I have of watching films with people I don't know. Those are the things that stick with me the most. Yeah, I was going to, I, so if you want to find uh, random people, Jennifer, um, the TCM uh, live tweets, which um, have been going for, for years and years are uh, like a great way to hear the kind of, uh, well, I was going to say the Vox Populi, but it's um, those people who are subscribing for premium cable in order to get TCM, right? There's the Vox Populi is a ever his, uh, receding horizon. Um, I mean, what's really stood out to me about Watch Party and Twitch and um, my own experiments in trying to press play at the same time uh, with my sister in California is that um, it's another step in the eroding um, medium specificity between film and television, right? So I would argue that um, film ceased to be, well, movies ceased to be primarily films in the mid 1980s when those producing them um, understood, and I'm speaking here to the US commercial context, um, understood the majority of their profits were coming from video distribution. So I think, you know, to um, follow up on what Francesco was saying, we're well served to think of cinema as a space and um, to understand that this content migrates from one space to another. And um, the, the architecture, the material environment, the technological environment in which we encounter these objects are, are deeply um, constitutive of what we understand those objects to be. So, um, so I, I sort of don't see much of a relationship between um, watch party and the idea of cinema um, for all of the reasons that, that these, these wonderful speakers um, have identified. And yet, if we think about the history of television, there are all kinds of precedents for understanding this kind of collective viewing. Great. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to add, I mean, I, um, I've tried doing the um, live viewing, and it it, uh, it it makes me feel a bit too melancholic about what I'm not doing, which is I'm not in a movie theater. Um, but the things that I the the kind of communal uh, gathering kind of moments that I have appreciated, I've been around uh, very particular kinds of programming, which is built up to um, live conversations. And, and here I'm thinking particularly of the programming around uh, the New Negress Film Society's uh, second conference, um, the, the, the kind of finite period of time that the films are available, which then builds on, which uh, builds up to some great conversations uh, and live chats, which that was uh, uh, as close as I got. And also with the Black Star Film Festival this, um, uh, this year as well. Um, but the actual live viewing, um, yeah, I, I, I need to strengthen my fortitude for that, I think. Great, thanks. We've got a couple more questions. Uh, one from Chris, uh, this is prompted by Caitlin's remarks, she says, and 
in thinking about cinema as a hospitality industry, we also have to think about how that industry is itself on the verge of collapse. For me, this moment hasn't been defined by escape, but rather by critical involvement and the immense pressure I feel to support local restaurants. Parentheses, my most meaningful relationship in the pandemic is with the owner of my local wine bar who had to pivot to retail. But I can't really order daily takeout from my local movie theater. I can pay to rent a film via the Lamley app rather than say Apple, but I can't save my local cinema via at-home rentals despite the immense pressure I feel to do so. How do we reconcile this? Cinema is a collective experience with this sense of individual responsibility to rescue the things we love so they remain available in the future. Caitlin, you get to go first, I think. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I find that a really, um, really profound and generative question. Thank you, Kristen, because I've been thinking for a while now, um, about this, this desire, the sense of responsibility to rescue in relationship to material media objects, um, most specifically um, my deteriorating VHS and Laserdisc collection, which is largely comprised of films that were never released on DVD and aren't going likely, aren't likely to be available on streaming. And so in that case, I feel a, a, a sense of um, physical custodianship for an object that I adore, but in order to, to adore the thing in itself, right, to adore the real thing as opposed to um, my, my fantasy of, of it, the objet petit a that I have invested in it, I have to accept it as a deteriorating object, right, as subject to time, um, like I am like my dogs are, like all of us are, um, which is awful and bittersweet and heartbreaking as love really inevitably is. To love something is to love it despite of the, lo the loss you know will come somehow, some way, someday. Um, in terms of, and I do feel this too, in terms of my local cinemas. Um, the, the cinema closest to me is um, a micro cinema that was hanging on by a thread before the pandemic and is now uh, mostly selling takeout cocktails and has opened up um, a Patreon account. And um, I am sure if I told the owners that I am loving them as an object that will one day <laughs> disappear, they'd probably pop me, <laughs> you know, they should. They should slap me at the very least. Nobody wants, to hear that, but I'm trying to think about um, while while having this deep respect and anxiety for um, the well-being of people we care about and institutions um, that we want to see thrive, that we think add valuable good in the world, also find some way to reconcile that with the knowledge that change is inevitable. That cinema was never a static object, that there were always iterations of cinema that closed and new iterations that opened. Um, and so I would say like if one of the outcomes of this is that um, the underground cinema movement has a new blossoming and flourishing um, in the wake of um, the pandemic, which I see as a real possibility, um, that's something I can be hopeful about. That's something I can invest um, love and, um, and desire into. But yeah, the responsibility to rescue is, is the burden of, or the feeling of a responsibility to, to rescue is the burden of love, I think. Anybody else or shall we move on? We have two more questions. Let's move on. Next question from Bhaskar Sarkar. This one's inspired by James from the other room, chancing upon James at the computer. To the extent that the quote, accidental appearance, the disappearance or haunting is planned, I wanted to hear a bit from the panelists about how design slash accident or script slash disruption might figure in our thinking about the ends of cinema. Yeah, uh, I guess 
Great question, Bashkar. I, I love this question. And, you know, of course, this is a, a form of choreography and a simulation of accident. But I think that every medium reveals itself through its accidents. I mean, this is another way that one, besides the ends of cinema, you can write a history of cinema through its breakdowns, its accidents, its catastrophes. Um, and, you know, that's something that, that uh, you know, your colleague, Greg Siegel, I've tried to do it. I think Renee Brockner, who might be here, has tried to do it. And so, I mean, what, what I found striking, because I'm always on the lookout for this, is that besides the kind of breaks in the network that distributes these things to us and then reveals at least something of the kind of distribution of access to good resources and infrastructure, um, is that it's really hard to find the accident in, or I'm having a hard time recognizing the accident in the kind of material forms in the kind of digital media um, as media versus their content. I think at the level of content, nothing has given us access to accidents more than amateur cinematography on YouTube and elsewhere. Um, you know, I think every witnessing of the brutality of the police state right now all these surprising, you know, the world is healing, nature's coming back moments that people have made memes out of, um, have opened the accidental to uh, a profound expansion of amateur cinema. But it's becoming harder for me, and I know there's other people on this uh, panel who probably can tell me exactly where to look. It's been harder to recognize the kind of rupture of the, the film strip you know, the, I was once at a screening of Fer Flaming Star, the Elvis film, where the, the film caught on fire. And, you know, those kind of moments are just so exciting. And it's harder to find those breakdowns in a way that reveals something about the apparatus. Um, and so uh, that's where I've been thinking about it. And this is kind of what I'm yearning to to discover. So it's it's been a question that's haunting me. Yeah, I think Michael wanted to say something just briefly, though, James, glitches in digital transmission are places to look. I was watching a series, I forget what it was, and I had watched one or two episodes. And when I turned it on for the next episode, it was five episodes ahead. Huh. And I think somehow it had kept playing continuously when I turned it off. So there are, there are <laughs> glitches, I think, there too. Yeah, Michael. Uh, no, I just wanted to shout out um, Legacy Russell's book, Glitch Feminism, a Manifesto, which has been something that in the absence of <laughs> actual uh, uh, theater going, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it has helped me kind of uh, begin to revisit my uh, conception of the deliberateness of the digital. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's been a, an, an inspiring read. As, as it's something to think about. Anybody else want to think about accident or say something? I have a wonderful memory of a fly which was on, on, on the lenses of the projector. And it, it was a, uh, James, it was a pain level movie in unintentional, but it was spectral, purely spectral. Next question, uh, Maggie Hennefield says, I'm really into this battle royale between the mask and the beer, as Jocelyn echoed Caitlin's brilliant formulation. The tension between ethical spectatorship versus escapist enjoyment. I'm thinking about the ends or afterlife ghosts garbage of cinema as spawn of that dialectic. Wondering if panelists have further thoughts on that front, especially thinking about the material spaces in which cinema will survive both amid and in the aftermath of the pandemic. Perhaps even via James' uncanny virtual background or Michael's remarks on collective audience laughter, rebad Q and A's in New York and Jennifer's discussion of activist media responses to species extinction. What are the mask facing or ethical takeaways from the pandemic toward the future of cinema that can pave the way for new forms of collective enjoyment? Sorry, this question is long. Thanks for such a brilliant evocative panel. Jump in. There's been a nice little commentary on the chat for the panelists. 
Uh, I don't think everyone else can read it, so I'll just read Michael's, who suggests we should have a new category or book, Introduction to Cinema Studies, The Mask and Beer Dialectic. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask maybe why would the mask be the ethical side? Would perhaps the beer be the ethical side and the mask would be the uh, <laughs> repressive side? I don't know, just kind of riffing with it. But it strikes me that with uh, the previous question about accidents, um, what's revealed with glitches is, you know, the digital and there's something not as satisfying about the digital apparatus being revealed. And it's more satisfying to see the analog for me, the analog apparatus revealed. Um, but anyway, I'm skipping over the question of ethics. So I'll, I'll be quiet unless someone else talk about that. One of the things that's really been interesting to me um, over the course of the pandemic and trying to understand why media objects I used to love are working, aren't working for me and media objects I used to scorn um, like the sitcom or um, certain kinds of like Oscar Beatty movies um, are suddenly like doing it uh, in a way that they never did before. Um, I've been trying to think more about escapism and um, within our field, there's really shockingly little written about escapism um, as a spectatorial practice. We've sort of like punted that over into some disreputable dark corner uh, that no one wants to wander into. Um, so there's, there's some interesting work um, in uh, Jackie Stacy's uh, first book, but they're just like, we have, as a field, I want to say, failed to take escapism seriously. And so I'm really hoping that that is um, one of the forms of collective enjoyment that we're going to start talking about uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Like one of the things that's um, occurred to me in my space of um, immense privilege during this pandemic, by which I mean, um, having relatively safe access to groceries, the ability to create um, a bubble to my satisfaction, stable um, shelter, is that um, the escapism I'm seeking is not another place, it's another time. But where I've been able to find um, theories of escapism, it's always to an elsewhere, not an else when, which is bizarre because at least in my personal experience, what cinema does even better than the elsewhere is the else when. Um, so that's something I've started thinking about and, and trying to think through to the extent that I am capable of um, complex thought at all during, under these conditions, which ain't much. Um. Did anybody want to say? All right, I'll go ahead and start talking. Um, thanks for the question, Maggie. Um, maybe I'm feeling a bit um, a, a bit contrarian about what constitutes escapism, but I'm I'm actually thinking about the work that I really appreciated this year in terms of thinking of the anti-racist film list uh, tendency uh, as as a form of escapism. Um, in, 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 in the sense of this investment, again, that uh, in, this, in these times of uprising, that one can watch the help and, and that will change the world uh, to some extent at, at, at that moment in terms of Netflix programming. So I just wanted to at least uh, kind of still, still driving a lot of pleasure from revisiting work like Melina Guna's uh, revisiting lists in a time of rebellion. And, and Raquel Gates's uh, piece in the New York Times, the problem with anti-racist movie lists. Um, because I think in terms of how, however we, uh, if we're realistically thinking about the fact of when we're going to have this moment of, of going to a movie theater again, as being realistically 2022, um, I would hope that we would do so with less delusions about what cinema can do. Or, or, or rethink the investments that were perhaps that are too often um, guiding the way that people engage with cinema. Anybody else want to get on that? 
If not, I have a question for you guys. I'll say oh, something. Really there is, there is, <laughs> um, go ahead. There's also another question, but go ahead. Okay, just, I'll just I'll be very very quick. Um, just, take your time. Okay, um, I I just wanted to say that uh, I couldn't agree more with what both Caitlin and Michael just said. I too have not not terribly been interested in uh, any in that much media that's come out right now. I want things that take me to another time. The else when is such a provocative term to think about with that. Um, but if you engage the else when, does that get us out of this false catharsis of, um, oh, I've, I've done my political work by watching by watching the help. I really hope nobody ever says that. That would, that would be a really, um, that, that would be like a bar fight conversation for me probably. <laughs> but um, uh, but I, I think that uh, those two are not opposed, right? The notion of uh, taking escape as an else when and the notion of resisting the false catharsis are actually in some ways like symbiotic ways of approaching a kind of version of, I don't know if I wanna call it ethical escapism, but maybe um, an escapism that doesn't participate in all the same standard delusions of, of escapism. I miss bar fights. Thanks, Jocelyn. I miss bar fights so much, Michael. <laughs> um, the, yeah, speaking of the else when, I mean, I've been watching 60s, rock documentaries, rockumentaries, and it's about being in places and with people. That's been so satisfying to me. Uh, Carlos uh, Case has a comment and a question about contingency and materiality. So the first time I saw the Battle of Chile, it was a shrunken 16 millimeter print that got stuck in the gate of the projector and melted three different times. My experience in those moments reinforced Michael's notion that formalism and cultural studies are not mutually exclusive because I couldn't help but think that the content of the film willed its material form to combust. That's a great comment. Anybody want to pivot off that? All right, so I have a question about future. Do you guys envision a kind of real renaissance of cinema? I mean, we've, you know, the book is on ends of cinema and part of the thesis is that every end is a beginning. I mean, do you expect theaters to be packed in 2022? Um, and also do you expect some of the other forms of viewing that we've been talking about here to um, return? or to, you know, make a kind of new uh, sort of theatrical uh, form of exhibition. I mean, I don't know, I hadn't really been thinking about it, but these conversations prompted that. Should we I mean, I think Yeah, go ahead. With the, um, the kind of final nail in the coffin of the Paramount decrees uh, in the middle of the pandemic, I feel quite certain that like your your good old corporate multiplex is going to be doing just fine. They may get bought up by um, a different conglomerate than owns them at present. Um, but in as much as um, they they've you know been um, given given the license um, to resort to. Um, anti-competitive trade practices that have been illegal for the last 50 years, no, 70 years. I don't know, time has lost all meaning, right? Um, I, think there, I think we're going to see a radically different, more centralized version of cinema, but also thus a return, um, a return in a way to, to the past. I think there will be um, a lot of golden opportunities for cinema historians um, to chime in about um, the consolidations ahead. But there, that is in a way um, a lifeline for cinema, although maybe not the cinema, the ideal cinemas that we have um, playing in our minds when we think about that elsewhere. Um, just to kind of add to that, um, I mean, I particularly like Caitlin, thank you for shouting out micro cinema. Um, I, I, I think that that is what I'm going to be most excited about the possibilities of, I mean, particularly in terms of thinking about the, the ex <laughs> just what exhibitional sites 
will survive. Um, and, you know, in this way, I mean, just to shout out one, I mean, they kind of self-identify as a nomadic micro cinema, but no evil eyes, no evil eyes cinema, which began in, in out of uh, Columbus, Ohio and came to New York and then went down to Atlanta. And I think they've even gone to New Orleans. They had a good run. Uh, and I and I hope for more of that, of a kind of um, micro cinema barnstorming that might need to happen. I think we're all uh, zoomed out and uh, that's it on our questions on YouTube or wherever. I don't know if any panelists have a question or if we should just uh, head off into the weekend. Um, Friday afternoon, this is like our typical center for 21st century studies time for conferences. And when you're on campus, Friday afternoon is a fantastic time, I think, because People, the week's over, people want to see each other. It's a kind of launching, you know, get together, go to a talk and then go have a drink or dinner or whatever afterwards. And I am have been thinking that, you know, doing something Friday at late afternoon in this pandemic world may not be the best time. I mean, by the end of the week, it's just like, oh my God, another, another thing. So anyway, it's been a long semester for all of us, um, but, Thank you audience for uh, being here and for providing these questions. And um, thank you panelists as well. So with that, uh, we'll bid you adieu. Uh, I put the um, discount code in the chat for everyone who's on the uh, webinar and it's available discount codes on the C21 website as well. If you wanna order the book, it fits really nicely into a stocking. I think so uh, if that's if that's your bag. Anyway, thanks everybody and uh, Kyle, I think we're done.